night tonight, everybody. This is our seventh lecture for our Menu for Change program. And uh, oh, I bet you couldn't wait to talk about sugar. So, ooh, here it is, my favorite subject. All of you have braved the, the traffic of Seattle and the many subscribers coming in. But um, what I'm going to do is talk about a number of things related to sugar. Uh, briefly go over the inspiration uh, that sugar had for me to start the Menu for Change program. Go uh, a little bit into a mini history of sugar. Talk about the types of sugar, chemical structure, ooh, bio, biochemistry, uh, taste, so all about the tongue. Go over sugar <laughs> substitutes, talk about measurement of sugar. Uh, briefly look at some labels and ingredients uh, looking for sugar. Uh, mention addiction criteria, which is really key to the talk. Um, talk a little bit about political regulation, which is a loaded subject, and then a few, a few good websites. So, as we go along, if there are questions that pop up, feel free to uh, jump in and ask. You don't have to save it to the end. Uh, just raise your hand. So the inspiration for this program, I really think uh, this is kind of summing it up. Really, we in the medical profession, we get uh, daily a lot of these throwaway magazines that talk about obesity and the weight management and the healthcare costs related to uh, obesity. And uh, this has been pretty much ever since I've been in practice, but more so in the past five to 10 years, and then over the past three to five years. And uh, although we all feel like we should address it and do a better job, I think our current healthcare system makes it difficult and is fraught with challenges. So fast forward to about four years ago, when uh, I had the amazing opportunity to take part in a, a retreat put on by Debbie Brainerd, who's at the very top there with me, uh, who's a local and national philanthropist uh, established Islandwood over in Greenbridge Island, to many of you may have uh, been to Islandwood. And she worked uh, for five years actually, got together uh, a three day uh, conference or retreat and invited scientists and researchers from all over the country and even other countries to partake in this. So it was really an amazing three day whirlwind of lectures and information and sharing and uh, knowledge. And some of this is really kind of cutting edge. So we had, um, I was delighted to be able to bring the Seattle contingent, that's the Seattle contingent there. So this is Dr. Hintergarth there in the end. You may remember our January lecture, one of our cardiologists. Next to him is Megan, who's one of our polyclinic nutritionists. Next to her is my friend Eve, who's a trainer there in the back. Claudia, who's no longer with us, is one of our uh, quality diabetic managers. And then uh, private nutritionist Tracy. And I think this meal was a lunch, kind of looks like a, deconstructed taco, but without the taco. So uh, they had food prepared for, a, for, for us throughout the entire conf conference, uh, most from organic farms and local produce and markets. And uh, interestingly, it was all sugar free, which was quite an interesting deal. So I think on day three, I started to get a little headachey, a little cranky, and I realized maybe I was going through withdrawal because uh, it's not that I avoid sugar, but you know, you don't have sugar for three days. It's, it's kind of like going out of coffee. So the second evening was amazing. Uh, there was a Lifetime Achievement Award presentation to none other than Jack Lane. So that's Jack there. Uh, and uh, my picture with him is quite a cutie pie. So sad he passed away. And his wife Elaine Lane was there too. And so they just made this amazing duo. And uh, it was a, a really an evening never to forget. So I came back from this uh, three-day seminar just kind of buzzing with ideas, and I thought, what can I do differently? How can we approach the subject, and how can we work it into more of a program? So that's kind of how this all started. So let's go through an extremely brief history of sugar. Uh, we all know it comes from sugar cane, and this goes back to even 8,000 BC or so, we think, to tropical Southeast Asia, and sugar cane was extracted, um, uh, sugar juice from the sugar cane, and then in India, they learned to make uh, sugar granules from the sugar cane juice. So kind of a different process. Uh, the medieval Islamic world then really saw more cultivation and manufacture of sugar cane. And really it spread into the West Indies and the tropical Americas uh, by the 16th through the 19th centuries. And um, beet sugar and, and high fructose corn syrup and other sweeteners really didn't develop until to the 19th and 20th centuries. In fact, high fructose corn syrup wasn't even invented until so, interesting. <laughs> so, how many types of sugar are there? Any guesses? Any? Who wants to guess? Ten. Ten? I hear ten. Higher? One type? Okay. Anyone else? Lots. 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 
Like, oh, well. <laughs> I think I lost track after 70. There might be more than 70. <coughs> really, the point of the slide is not to memorize it, but I guess in a way to be overwhelmed by it and to realize when you look at a nutrition label, you don't always, it doesn't say sugar all the time. You may see, you know, invert sugar. You may see turbinado sugar. You may see, you know, icing sugar or dextrin. So there's lots of different ways sugar can be represented in a nutrition label. And that's important to remember as you start looking at them carefully. So back to, gosh, Biochemistry 101, for those who attended. Uh, sucrose, which is white sugar, that's what we're talking about, is the molecules made up of glucose and fructose. And um, that's important to know, because glucose by itself, you know, fructose by itself, uh, those are components we use in our body. But it's a combination of these two together that makes up the sucrose molecule. And this is important to people who manufacture different substances like high fructose corn syrup in terms of how these molecules are broken apart and kind of uh, metabolized. So why do we like sugar? There are lots of reasons we like sugar, but I think one of them is taste. So energy-dense foods, uh, like sugar, uh, please our palate. You know, the, these elaborate sweet taste receptors on our tongue uh, palate and the palate, they code this sweet message and they send this information to our brain to act in very specific brain systems and I'll mention that a bit later as well. This is um, kind of a rudimentary uh, diagram and I really think that there are many versions of this. It's not precisely this way on your own tongue, but many people agree that the, the very tip of your tongue is where the sweet uh, receptors are. I mean, if you, put ton, if you put sugar in the back of your mouth, it still tastes sweet because there are also receptors in your palate, but primarily it's the tip. So, thinking about taste, um, I actually remember seeing the 60 Minutes uh, presentation, I think it was about a year ago, and I wanted to just show you the preview, and, and it was on a topic, I don't know if anyone saw this program, it's called The Flavorists, and there are chemists and science, scientists who really spend day and night working in lab bench uh, uh, you know, facilities, get paid, to come up with tastes for our tongue. Now, it doesn't just mean sugar or sweet. It can be all sorts of tastes. It can be chicken soup taste or you know, orange peel taste. But it's interesting when you think about, you, know, you read the label, and it says natural flavorings or artificial flavorings. You know, there's a lot that's concocted in this. So I'm going to see if this loads up. Earlier, I realized that as I loaded it, there's actually a, uh, an advertisement that plays too, so I'll try and minimize the sound just for the ad. And so maybe I won't. So we'll just ignore this advertisement for a product we really don't need. So definitely an aroma, the Mandarin Dancy Tangerine. Meet the flavor whose mission for the food industry is to create an irresistible craving for everything from chicken soup to soda pop. We want, you know, a burst in the beginning and maybe a finish that doesn't linger too much so that you want more of it. Ah, <laughs> so I think it's going to be a quick fix. And then Not more. But that suggests something else, which is called addiction. Exactly. You're trying to create an addictive taste. That's a good word. So if you get a chance to see that, it's really a great show. I just love Morgan Safer. He has that really hilarious grin. Mm -hmm. There we go. So let's talk about sugar substitutes. So everyone's seen all these little substitutes. You go to your favorite restaurant and you pick out from the little bowl the color that you like. And hopefully it doesn't have any calories in it and you're trying to do it because you're trying to lose weight. But um, here's my home, home style picture of several. Uh, you can tell I went to the Dahlia Lounge there. But uh, these have been around for, for, many, for many of these for a very long time. And I think it's important to know where they come from and kind of the history of how they were produced. So looking at saccharin, which is the main ingredient of sweet and low, that's the pink one. Um, sweet and low actually is a mixture of nutritive dextrose, another sugar term, saccharin, cream of tartar, and calcium silicate. This was actually uh, formulated uh, way back in 1878 by a chemist at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, very popular during World War I, as there were a lot of sugar shortages. And uh, very popular with dieters in the 60s and 70s. We all remember all those pink packets. 
There was, um, for quite some time, a safety controversy, and it really boils down to, in a nutshell, bladder cancer in rats. I think that was eventually refuted, the rat body being different than the human body, and there are reasons to say that you know, it's probably generally okay. So eventually it was cleared, and today it still remains as an option um, for, for sweeteners. So <coughs> high-dose corn syrup, that was introduced in 1957. Um, really produced heavily in Japan in the mid-60s to early 70s, exported and then rapidly introduced into countless uh, processed foods and soft drinks in this country uh, in 1975 through 1985, so very quickly during the 10-year period. Uh, and high fructose corn syrup is really, it's a very complex process, it's highly processed. <coughs> it starts from corn, of course, and corn is milled to produce corn starch, and then that's processed to make corn syrup, which for all practical purposes is glucose. And then that's converted uh, to fructose by different enzymes and, and, and processes. So it's, a, it's not quite a simple step. It's a very complex purification, highly <coughs> purified end product. And there's a term that the uh, US uh, FDA has coined. It's called BRAS, or G-R-A-S. And that stands for generally recognized as safe. So they considered uh, high fructose corn syrup to be generally recognized as safe back in 1976. And I find it interesting to note that really between the early 70s up to the year 2000, there was a 25% increase in added sugars in food products. And I think a lot of it has to do with this kind of rapid availability, you know, forms everywhere, and uh, the ease of which they could put it into food products and substitute for other sugar. So interesting story. Uh, stevia, many folks have heard about stevia, and uh, the ads always get you know, natural, well, sugar's natural too. <laughs> so stevia is a genus of uh, plant species, there are probably 240 of them or more. They're native to South America, Central America, and Mexico. Uh, the leaves have about 30 to 45 times the sweetness of sucrose. Uh, but the compound that's produced from these leaves, called Rebiana or Rebiocide, is 250 to 300 times as sweet as sucrose. So you just need a little bit. So there was quite a controversy. I really knew nothing about this until I researched this. Uh, this was actually, this product was banned by the <coughs> FDA in 1991. There were multiple safety concerns. I think some of it revolved around the potential for stroke or diabetes or other things no one wants. So, uh, and as you might imagine, there was quite a lot of political uh, dispute, certainly fueled by the marketers of this product and consumers, people who wanted to use it in their products or in their homes. So in 2008, which really wasn't that long ago, uh, the FDA gave a no objection, I think that's probably like generally recognized as safe, uh, gave a no objection approval to Truvia and Purevia, who those are the two brand names of products. And you look at some of the data and where this is all kind of funding from. So Truvia was developed by a cargo company, the Coca-Cola company, and Purevia was developed by PepsiCo and others. So it kind of makes you think. Um, and again, this, the derivative from the leaves are, is really quite highly purified, and that's what gives it the sweetness. There's the pretty flower plant, looks gorgeous. The bottom kind of looks like mint or catnip. Um, and those are some products you've probably seen now. Again, there's more than just the stevia leaf extract in these two. There's dextrose and sales powder, natural flavors, so maybe something's added to, to heighten the sense of enjoyment. So, you know, you're paging through a magazine and you see some ads and they're always trying to sell you stuff, right? And I just love these two ads. And I'll read the one on the left for you. It says, wouldn't it be nice if your coffee wasn't swirled with guilt? Now there's a natural sweetener born from the leaves of the stevia plant. It won't saddle you with guilt or make your butt look fat. It comes with zero calories and a taste that's luscious, sweet, and clean. It grows where your cravings meet your conscience without compromise. Sweetness without angst, how perfectly delicious. Find it at your grocery store. And you know, again, it's just the sense of like, hey, try this, it's gonna save your save your waistline. And I look at the other ads, same spiel, different words, and uh, I just can't imagine sprinkling sugar on the gorgeous pile of fruit. So again, it's kind of just rubs rubs you raw. That's what's out there. <laughs> So sucralose, which is Splenda, Splenda has sucralose and dextrose and maltodextrin, generally recognized as safe uh, for the FDA. It's 600 times as sweet as, as sucrose. So that's that uh, little, that little yellow packet. 
And um, it's now found in well over 4,000, 5,000 food and beverage products. Interestingly, probably promoted by tennis because it doesn't um, produce dental cavities. So. Here's another ad. So as if they're not finished selling us this uh, wonderful sweet substitute, they have to tell us, oh, now we've added fiber, so of course it's good for you. So it just kills me. So agave nectar or agave syrup, um, this, this may appear in some of your beverages. So it comes from the agave plant, which is native to Mexico and South Africa. Uh, it's made up of fructose and glucose, remember that, with sugar. Uh, it's only just, you know, one to two times sweeter than sucrose, so it doesn't give you a blast of sweet. And uh, claim to fame, really, it it's dissolves quickly, has a different melting point, so it can be used in cold beverages, it doesn't have to be heated. So you might find this often in products like iced tea and smoothies and cocktails. So there's the plant, very pretty. Aspartame, wow, kind of the biggest to last. So NutraSweet and Equal. Uh, contain aspartame. Equal is combined with aspartame and dextrose and maltodextrin. And uh, really, when you research this, you're kind of blown away by all the data out there. And it's really felt to be one of the most thoroughly tested and studied food additives the FDA has ever approved. Uh, originally, it was approved in 1974, but uh, it was highly contested for uh, lots of reasons in terms of really safety questions. There were legal battles all the way up to Congress. Uh, it's really wild to, to look at the, the, the data on this. And even an internet conspiracy theory, which has, uh, you know, who knows who's putting that out. But again, um, generally recognized as safe, except for people with a specific inborn error metabolism, a genetic disorder called PKU, or phenylketonuria. And if you have it, you know you have it. It's not like you've got to have it or not. It's something from birth and it's hereditary. So that's why they have to label every product with aspartame on it, not for those to be consumed, people with PKU. It's about 200 times sweeter than sucrose, and again, found in so many different food and beverages uh, sold worldwide, so it's pretty ubiquitous. So those are the sugar substitutes. Kind of mull over that for a moment. Um, let's talk briefly about measurement, because sometimes I think it gets confusing, you know, grams and ounces and teaspoons, and you know, how do you have to figure out how much is in something? So just a very basic formula, uh, the middle line is you know, one teaspoon is about four grams, which is about 16 calories. And so a cup of white sugar would be 48 teaspoons and two grams. Now remember, this 15, 16 calories, these are empty calories. They're not, they're nutrient poor, they're energy rich. So it's, it's not necessarily a good thing, but again, so a calorie is not always a calorie. So let's look at a few labels and ingredients. And my favorite one to talk about, which is always a treat, of course, is Pop-Tart. So I'm sure everyone's had a Pop-Tart at least once in their life, and I know I had more than one during residency, probably at two in the morning when I was on call. And it gives you that buzz. You don't have to toast it, by the way. You can eat it raw. And when you look at the, at the menu, or the listings of the ingredients, there's more sugar in there than you know what to do with. You know, there's sugar and dextrose and high fructose corn syrup and corn syrup salads and sugars and ugh, it goes on and on. So yeah, it's loaded with sugar. Um, just as an aside, you can also see how many other ingredients are in there. And if you can pronounce and spill all of them, then wow, you should probably eat it. So 19 grams of sugar in this, which is what about five teaspoons? Look at this. So we have this lovely Italian soda and buy racks of them at Costco. Look, there are only six ingredients, and only sugar, and all those other needs of sugar. But you go down to the bottom, it has 31 grams of sugar. That's more than a Pop-Tart. Wow. So I just thought this was, the, this was the best Amazon customer review. I have no idea who wrote this. But it says, stack up on this drink, especially on hot summer days. It is something you will need to need more of. I haven't used it with any booze, but I bet you can mix some interesting drinks with it. A kind of mildly flavored, not too sweet, just a susan of bitterness with a sweet and sparkle. Very, very refreshing. Wow. They're, they're really marketing that. You sell that down in the restaurant here. That's not our restaurant, but you're exactly right. <laughs> 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 yeah, 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 yeah. And didn't you feel like you were enjoying this nice, yeah. fruity, yeah. healthy yeah. drink? Didn't it, didn't it seem refreshing to you? So yeah, but really when you look at these labels, it's it's an eye opener. I mean here we know a Pop Tart is loaded, right? Look at that. That's you know several more teaspoons than a Pop Tart. So now if you had that with your Pop Tart, you'd do 
<laughs> so now think of things that aren't necessarily obvious. So look at pasta sauce. Now this, of course, 12 grams of sugar. Would you go ahead and sprinkle three teaspoons of sugar on top of your dinner, if you have pasta dinner at the table, or if you're making it, would you dump in half a cup of sugar in your pasta sauce no. and you made it from scratch? Well, some of the historical recipes from Italy and how you kind of stew the tomatoes for eight hours and get it going and get those flavors mixing. But you just have to stop and think. You know, it's really necessary, especially when you're buying it from a product in a jar. And believe me, I, I don't eat Three Musketeers, but I love this ad. I, I find it scary, not scary smart, but scary. And it's really the small print, which I can barely read. And it says, the big fluffy chocolate you've always loved and 45% less fat than the average of the leading chocolate brands. Simply brilliant. Like, wow, so we're so focused on the fact that it has less fat, less than what? And then, of course, you look and it has 36 grams of sugar. Of course, we know sugar's in the chocolate bar, but this kind of misleading misinformation is pretty much in almost every product. And oh, you can get mint, by the way, so if that's not enough, you know, they can get one that has mint in it. So let's, now that I've warmed you up to the topic, let's talk about addiction. And uh, there's a lot of uh, flurry of activity and research when it comes to food addiction and sugar addiction and uh, kind of making parallels to the world of drug addiction. And I want to uh, show you a lovely photograph of my daughter about to dive into a delicious ice cream sundae or whatever that is up in Whistler, BC. And then there's a homemade, uh, I think it was a spice cake I made one year with this kind of glazed topping. It has some orange peel, it's really yummy. And off to the side, I think some, you know, they don't photograph very well, but there's these thumbprint jam Christmas cookies that were really divine. Yeah. So, you know, we're already, you know, brains are now thinking sugar, we're starting to salivate, get the tip of that tongue over. And of course, you know, you walk into a fancy hotel with your husband, you've made reservations, and off to the side in your room, they have this little arrangement, and they're, they're like little ice cream cones, except it's the biggest chocolate truffle I've ever seen. And I think I passed out after eating part of it. <laughs> it was good. And then uh, off to the side, of course, who wouldn't want their 10th birthday at the top of a space needle? And the P.S. de resistance at the very end of the meal is that lovely um, dry ice uh, event with the, the, the ice cream. It's just it's lovely. Yeah. So that, those are things we just we think about and we cherish and remember. So, I actually had the delight to meet uh, Dr. Sergei Ahmed, who was um, at this retreat back in 2009. He uh, serves as a research director for the Institute of Neurogenerative Diseases at the University of Bordeaux in France, and really has shown in animal models that sweet taste activates brain systems that are also targeted by drugs of abuse. Wow, that's pretty powerful. And also, uh, really shows that there exist clear behavioral, psychological, and neurobiological commonalities between sweet diets and drugs of abuse. Again, we feel like, wow, this, that's pretty heavy. So can sugar really be compared to cocaine and heroin and nicotine and alcohol? That's, that's, that's pretty heavy, dude. So I want to show another little 60 minutes. I don't know why these are all 60 minutes, but it turns out they're 60 minutes or And it's a program that's called Hooked. And uh, once again, Morley Safer uh, interviews uh, Dr. Nora Volkow, Volkow, who actually um, has been working passionately for decades as head of the National Institute of Drug Abuse, and uses brain scans and other ways of measuring data to see how addicts respond to the concept of not having drugs or trying to stay away from drugs, and how that overlaps into um, other addictive behaviors, including eating behaviors. And I'll try and load it up again. There's going to be another commercial, so apologize. Every day, thousands of people are choosing a Frank Tahoe and a fish gas. It's a labor of love. It's a lot of labor and it's a lot. And Dr. Volkov, if you ever look her up, has an amazing family legacy. Her uh, great grandfather from Russia was Leon Trotsky. And he died in Mexico City, and she grew up in the house that he died in. Very interesting story. <clears throat> At the most basic level, dopamine has saved us from extinction by making the key elements for survival of the species, food and sex, pleasurable. 
dopamine sends signals to receptors in the brain saying, this feels good. What is it, a hamburger? It's a hamburger. Show a hungry person a hamburger and their brain scan shows a dopamine rush. It just basically stimulates release of dopamine and the more they release, the more they want the food. We all say, well, why do we have a problem with obesity in our society? And I said, my God, we're surrounded by stimuli with which we're conditioned. If you like hamburgers, you may see the McDonald's yellow arches and then dopamine goes inside your brain and you want it. And you don't know why you want it. Hmm. Now, they're very fascinating programs. So if you want to watch it, you can go to the website and see the full, the full thing. So let's look at the four criteria of addiction. The first is binging. That's defined as the escalation of intake with a high proportion of intake at one time, usually after a period of voluntary abstinence or forced deprivation. So this is tightly linked to dependence on the topic. Uh, binge eating, as we all know, duh, implies lots of control. You're just scarfing down that pizza, finishing that bowl of ice cream, and another bowl. And uh, people usually binge on foods that are high in sugar and fat or carbohydrates. And a lot of that ties back into that dopamine surge into the so it's not that that's the only thing you want to start. I, I've never seen someone binge on 20 tomatoes. <laughs> Maybe they have. So the second is withdrawal. Uh, physical withdrawal is a physiological phenomenon <coughs> that results from a decrease in stimulation of cellular receptors that have become conditioned to consistent stimulation by a certain substance. So again, back to that dopamine pathway in the brain. People who typically consume high fat, High sugar foods experience anxiety, food cravings, and dysphoria, kind of a sense of surreal, when abstaining from these foods. So again, you kind of think of a, someone who's high in cocaine and not getting some, you know, here's that, that similar pattern of withdrawal. Cravings occur after a period of abstinence from substance use. Uh, they greatly enhance a user's, user's motivation to seek out and use the craved substance. You've got to have that sugar fix. got to have that chocolate. Stress not only induces or heightens cravings for drugs and abuse, but also impacts eating patterns. And most people, I guess approximately 70% of people, eat more food on a daily basis when they are under stress. And probably foods in those categories, including sugar. So the fourth criterion is a little hard to conceptualize. It's called cross-sensitization. And this refers to the fact that both food and drugs can acutely ameliorate cravings for and withdrawal from their counterparts. Someone's got to have a cigarette, no cigarette, we'll all have a glass of whiskey. You know, I mean, there's a cross sensitization there. Can't have that sugar, I'll just scarf down this big neck. So food consumption releases dopamine in the brain and activates the same reward pathways that drugs co-opt in addicts. And I mean, the, again, the research is pretty incredible when they're using PET scans and MRI scans, looking at the brain and seeing how these pathways are activated in people who are being either drawn from or given a substance that they're addicted. So food and drugs of abuse share many common properties and features, including similarities in their mechanisms of reward, the role of stress in stimulating cravings and relapse, and the role of learning in allowing users to associate food or drug use with a certain consistent outcome. If they eat this, they know they're going to feel better. It's, you know, they're getting their fix. So I have no idea how I found this. You can find everything on the internet. This is from a British tabloid, but when you dug deeper, it actually came from a story out of Boston, so it's not the Brits, it's our country. And this was a real article, how spraying vegetables with a sugar mist could help children eat their greens. I thought, how disgusting. <laughs> so we're starting at the age of one or two, or however old these kids are, we're spraying their vegetables with sugar so they can like them. And uh, well, after what we just learned about addiction and, and those, those pathways in the brain, wow, we're setting them up for kind of scary. And this was not from 20 years ago, this was from last year. So there are a number of amazing folks at the helm of research and uh, movers and shakers um, working with folks even in Washington, D.C. Uh, at this conference I attended to uh, Kelly Brownell was our um, keynote speaker and Dr. Brownell is a professor of psychology, epidemiology, and public health and director of the Red Center of Food Policy and Obesity at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, the second person here I've listed, Mark Gold. Dr. Gold is, um, <clears throat> holds the Distinguished Professor and Chair of Psychiatry at the McKnight Brain Institute 
at the College of Princeton, University of Florida in Gainesville. And they teamed together, they've been working together for decades, but they teamed together. This book just came out, in fact, just bought it. And um, it just got released a few months ago, and you can get it on Amazon. They really um, did a fine job at working with uh, probably hundreds, but dozens who are in the book and credited, uh, the top researchers and scientists looking at addiction. And they make a very interesting preface announcement uh, to this book. And they go really, uh, they make it a great point to say this is titled Food and Addiction, not Food Addiction. So I think that speaks to this controversy. You know, how can you be addicted to something that you need? It's not that you can't stop eating food. It doesn't make, it make sense, does it? So that's where there's been a lot of interesting journeys around this topic. And that's why it's harder, I think, to represent in terms of, of, of hardcore science. So all these folks I had, to, I had the pleasure to interact with at this conference. I've already mentioned Dr. Ahmed. And he was the one who actually showed in, in rat experiments that rats preferred sweet water, as he called it, or saccharin, over cocaine. They, they preferred sugar over cocaine. And they were more addicted to sugar than to cocaine. And that just kind of blows your mind. <coughs> Dr. Noble is a really distinguished uh, professor of psychiatry and biobehavioral sciences. He's at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. He's been doing extensive work for a long time on the genetics of addiction and actually looking at you know, genetic risks for obesity. So not that you can just say, ah, chuck it, it's my parents, but, but there's a lot of interesting dynamic research going on in that field. J. Jack Wong, who uh, is the chairman of the medical department, Brookhaven National Lab in Upton, New York, um, uh, gave a great talk all about dopamine again and dopamine deficiency in binge eating. And then he used certain um, high-tech scanners, like a PET scan and MRI, to look at these people's brains that he was studying. <clears throat> Again, remember that the original models were in the rat population, so that's where people kind of get a little anxious. Well, how can you extrapolate all that data to humans? But they really are doing that now with all these amazing technologies. Bart Hobel, who uh, is a professor of psychi uh, psychology at Princeton Neuroscience Institute, um, further looking at binge and withdrawal, and specifically looking at all of this related to sugar addiction, not just foods. And Eric Stice, kind of a local guy, he's from Eugene, Oregon. He's a senior research scientist at Oregon Research Institute, uh, doing a lot of the work that Jean Jack Wong is doing, but also looking at genetic and biologic or environmental factors that affect obesity. And there are so many other people I didn't list, but it, it's, it was a pleasure to interact with these people and to kind of follow their work. So let me um, briefly show you a few websites. Um, this is uh, uh, Dr. Brownell's and team's website at the Yale Red Center. It's, it's just a snapshot of uh, one of the pages. It's a wonderful uh, resource, especially for people interested in the politics, uh, good and the bad politics behind all this. He's really a strong advocate for um, trying to get sugar out of kids' lives and the schools and so forth. Um, and, and kind of have a regulation. Very interesting timing since we just heard, was it two days ago or was it yesterday, about Bloomberg and that, that uh, effort that failed in New York. Um, I'm not saying I'm for or against it, but it just demonstrates the uh, intense reaction that's happening when people even mention the subject. So he's been doing this for quite some time and the people he um, worked with are just amazing. Debbie Brainerd and a lot of people who've worked with her kind of anonymously got this site going. This website just got released a few months ago. It's brand new. It's called foodaddictionresearch.org. And uh, it's one of the most user-friendly sites I've seen. It's a big site. You can just click on things and you go to places and see video clips. It's so wonderfully organized, and it's uh, really a pleasure to look at. Well, don't forget that the Sugar Association has their own website. Um, so does the Corn Growers of America. But uh, this one is their website, in case you're interested. I just love that claim there. So sugar, not a major source of increased calories. Well, 15 calories, you know. But sugar's contribution to obesity is being overstated. Well, that's their opinion. <laughs> this last one is really kind of more graphic. It's kind of for kicks. But uh, I love the site. And many of you have probably seen this photo in some shape or form about how many sugar cubes are in a, a bottle or a can of Coke. And uh, wow, it just, that's a lot of sugar. Makes you think. So I did want to um, show one more video clip, uh, and it's uh, an interview that Sanjay Gupta has with uh, Dr. Robert Lustig, who's a pediatric endocrinologist at UC San Francisco. Uh, Dr. Lustig has his followers as well as the skeptics, but uh, he's really invested a lot of time and energy into this 
um, topic, and, uh, and you can be your own judge, but let's see if I can get this thing loaded up. Just about a year ago, we first reported on one doctor's war on sugar. Now, new studies are supporting his claim that sugar doesn't just make us fat, it is actually poisoning us. Last night in a 60 Minutes interview, Dr. Sanjay got to talk with the doctor about the impact sugar has on our diet. Is sugar toxic? I believe it is. Do you ever worry that that's, it just sounds a little bit over the top? Sure. All the time. But it's the truth. Dr. Robert Lustig is a pediatric endocrinologist at the University of California, San Francisco, and a pioneer in what is becoming a war against sugar. Do this. Motivated by his own patients, too many sick and obese children, Dr. Lustig has concluded that sugar, more than any other substance, is to blame. What are all these various diseases that you say are linked to sugar? Obesity, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and heart disease itself. Lustig says the American lifestyle <coughs> is killing us. And most of it, you say, is preventable. 75% of it is preventable. Cynthia Sass is with us now. She is a registered dietitian and nutritionist. Welcome. Thank you. So what do we need to do? We examine everything there is that might be sugar? We just need to change our habits. I mean, the amount of sugar that we're consuming today is unprecedented. The American public, the average American, takes in 22 teaspoons of sugar a day. So if you think about that amount in a year's time, it's about 17 four-pound bags of sugar per person per year. Um, why is it toxic? What does it do? Think about a glass of water and imagine that that's your blood. Now think about pouring sugar into that water. The more sugar is there, the thicker and more syrupy that water gets. When that's happening in your body, in your blood, your heart has to work harder to pump that thicker fluid through your system. It puts stress on the heart, it puts stress on the arteries, it increases blood pressure, <coughs> it taxes the kidneys, the liver. So it's really the amount that we have that's really causing these problems. We just saw some of the numbers on our screen there of what the recommended amount of sugar per day is. Give us an idea of, of not only what that actually works out to in terms of food and drink, but, but what sugar is healthy and what is not. The sugar that's healthy is the kind that comes from Mother Nature, the sugar that's in fruit, that's in yogurt, that's naturally occurring. So when you think about blueberries, a cup of blueberries, that has about seven grams of fructose, but it's bundled with antioxidants, vitamins, minerals, fiber. A can of soda has about 25 grams of fructose with no nutrients, so about three times more. So how do you avoid the sugar that you can't see or that you can't find on the label? You need to read the ingredient list. That's the only way to know if the sugar that's in the product is added, manufactured in, processed in, or it's coming from nature. Sit down, nice to see you. Thanks for being here this morning. So um, with that, I'm going to end my talk. And uh, hopefully this has been an interesting journey and perhaps the beginning, the beginning of a new journey as you think it's a little more about sugar in the diet. So I think it had to do with, well, 
probably before they, they figured out the PKE part of it, um, there were there were people who were reacting to it. I think part of that was the PKE story, the kind of continuary story. I think it had to do with um, you know the, the rights of manufacture and how it was produced. I, I didn't go into the details of you know why it was it was not clinically acceptable. I don't think it was um, like other products, like <coughs> saccharin, where there was a question mark of cancer in lab rats, or um, it was related to um, heart disease or vascular <coughs> problems. But and and it was the most widely you know battled out and contested substance, and and you can get lost in the in the files looking at this drug. It's, it's really incredible. With deep manners, which was on that so the question was about D-mannose, and that was one of the many, many kind of sugar products on the list. And would that activate the same pathway? <coughs> and, you know, to be honest, I can't sit here and say biochemically yes, but I'm assuming that because it has a sweet <coughs> response, um, that it stimulates the receptors. So the receptors are not sucrose receptors. They're sweet taste receptors, which is different. And beyond that, you're not sure of all the, the, the biochemical process that goes on. But if it's in a pill form where it would no taste to it, um, if it doesn't touch the front, does it still activate? Well, um, that's a great question. I think if it starts to go in the back of your mouth, we have those receptors in the palate, so they're behind the tongue. But if you're a purist and you're just swigging it down <laughs> and getting it in your stomach, then it's probably not activating any of those taste receptor pathways. So you're just getting like, the content of What's the answer? I mean, we can't we can't avoid all sugar. I mean, there's natural sugars in the fruit we eat and other things, and so we can't be afraid of it. But well, keep in mind that I will eat my chocolate chip cookie now and then. <laughs> <laughs> keep in mind that you know that very last piece the nutritionist was talking about the difference between natural fruit sugars. Um, so yeah. Of course, it has fructose, but it's not as highly processed, you know, devoid of nutrient. It's bad with other things. You're eating it with fiber and other maybe antioxidants. So it's a different, like she's her example is a blueberry. So that's different than taking a teaspoon of sugar. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, again, you know, I, I think about that retreat I went to, and really there were some amazing people, and there were some really interesting people who had. <laughs> basically spent weeks making their life devoid of any sugar substance. I don't know how they stay married and I don't know if they have kids, but you know, so some people really walk the line and just decide that they're not gonna have any sucrose or sugar whatsoever. I think well certainly in this country I think it's really hard to do. The question is if it's really necessary. And that's where that kind of blurred line is, you know, can you really compare it in that much of a way to a drug addiction? But there are people who eat sugar all the time, have no problem with the rate, they don't become diabetic, they're not even pre-diabetic. So it's not like it's an evil substance, but I think there's a lot more behind it that we just don't recognize or realize. And when we you know, start to think about some of these things, it gets, to me, it gets quite sober. A note on the stevia plant. I grew one a couple years ago, just saw it in the nursery and grabbed it and stuck it in the garden. Mm -hmm. The leaves to just pick off and eat are very sweet. Mm -hmm. um, it'd be great dried and added to a cup of tea or something, mm -hmm. but you know, I'm not going to go out and buy it in the product. You know, I'm not going to buy the product, but the plant itself, and it got really big. I think if we hadn't had a cold winter, it probably would have lasted all winter because it took up way more space in my vegetable garden than I had planned. It was really healthy. But the leaves were great. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a parallel between, I guess, cocaine and the coca plant, and you can suck on it, right? It's there you go. Sorry, cocaine. <laughs> So, you know, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's like you can pick mint for the garden. It's a beautiful yeah. taste. So, yeah. again, there's nothing wrong with that. But knowing kind of where it's from and how it's used right. and how it's purified and then put the substances, I think that's... Yeah, I would never do that, but that was just sort of an FYI. If somebody wants to grow a right. plant, it's pretty cool, right? Yeah. Can I ask another question about the honey? Because, you know, comparing, like, the blueberries versus sugar, would the honey, if you, if you were going to have something sweet in your tea, would the honey be a better choice? I think it's a fine choice. I think that there are other benefits of honey that go beyond just talking about calories or sweet taste. 
But again, my only point about including that in this kind of laundry list of sweet substances was that it, it hits your tongue and it's sweet and it's reminding your brain you're having something sweet. So you know, if you have tea without honey versus tea with honey, you know, you're reinforcing that need to have something pleasurable and sweet. So there's a, there's a huge distinction there. And there's nothing wrong with honey. I say, and there are other properties of honey that might place it above. Like or? Or? Well, sure. And actually, Dr. Kira might weigh in on honey, but I think there are other things that that honey can give to you that go beyond just plain old sucrose that's eating the table sugar. But uh, speaking only to the, the dopamine pathways in the brain okay. and the taste, they're, they're pretty much the same. Okay, yeah. When I, you know, I was born here, grew up in Ontario, Canada, and the British influence, you know, when I had tea, oh, you dumped milk and lots of sugar in it. That's how you had tea. And it's been a long time since I've had that. And now, if I put sugar in tea, I feel like I'm going to throw up. It just doesn't taste right. But you get used to certain things a certain way, and it's pleasurable to you. And so you get much more benefit from that wonderful, pleasurable cup of tea than fretting over whether you should put, you know, honey or sugar into it. So. I think it was discouraging for me is that I really do take a lot of time looking at labels, and yet I had no idea that all of those things there were sugar. So how I mean, there's really no way unless you're a scientist. <laughs> Well, and that's the sad truth. There's a lot of stuff on that list. I mean, what the heck is that? And, and really, not sugar. And so a lot of it's educating and, and reading up. And I mean, that's, I think it's it's hard these days to read lots of food labels when there's more than just a handful of ingredients. There's so many things to keep track of. Yeah. There's fat, there's carbohydrate, and there's you know, cholesterol, and there's sodium, and the list goes on and on. And it gets overwhelming. But thinking just about sugar, it's, I find it fascinating. There's so many different ways to get some sugar. Well, thank you all for coming and braving the traffic, and I hope you had a